Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brad Wolfenden, Director of Cyber Sports at Play Cyber and Chair of the Tortora Breda Institute's AI and Cybersecurity Task Force on the Talent Gap. On behalf of the Tortora Breda Institute, I would like to welcome you to our hot topic event, Women in Cybersecurity, Bridging the Gender Gap. A little about Tortora Breda and our session partners and sponsors. The Institute was created to promote collaboration across public and private sectors with a focus on business, culture, and diversity in order to improve and secure businesses and economies. A core concept of the Institute is our think tank for partnership excellence. The think tank has allowed us to bring together experts and leaders across the public, private, and academic sectors from around the world to develop and encourage collaboration and partnering practices while embracing the most critical technologies. I would also like to recognize our partner organization, the Association of US Cyber Forces, for all of their support in helping us put together this event. The Association of US Cyber Forces is a nonprofit, military, and veteran service organization that provides the voice for cyber professionals who serve in the military and with other national security agencies, as well as within industry on specific cyber issues impacting national security. AUSCF is an advocate for positive change to policies and programs that better serve our membership and help minimize gaps between the public and private sectors cybersecurity efforts. And last but certainly not least, a special thank you to our sponsor for today's event, the Gorilla Corporation. Gorilla Corporation is a leading global sales, marketing and technology channel development company with a focus on serving the technology industry. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our wonderful panelists for today's session. I will start with Dr. Olivia Hereford. And uh, Dr. Hereford, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, thanks, Brad. Uh, I am regional director for uh, the ICT digital media sector in the for the Bay Area Community College Consortium. And my role is really focused on um, supporting our career education programs and providing our students with the work-based learning opportunities. Wonderful, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. And next, Marcella Denniston. Hi, Brad. Uh, Marcella Denniston, Navy veteran uh, and, and subject matter expert in building Cybersecurity Operations Center. Uh, I'm also based in the Bay Area in San Francisco and currently running marketing for Foresight Cybersecurity. Excellent. Thank you. Next, Sandy, Ms. Sandy Silk. Thanks, Brad. I'm Sandy Silk. I'm a senior workshop director at uh, Infotech Research Group, which is an IT advisory and consulting service. Uh, I lead week-long workshops with clients on building security strategy, developing security incident response plans and such. While I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts, this week I'm finding myself in Fort Myers, Florida, uh, enjoying the lovely weather here and the, the great people. Wonderful. And thank you, Sandy. I don't know if it was just me or uh, volume was a little bit low, so maybe we can get you to check that while we introduce Ms. Renata Spinks. Hey, good afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world today. Um, I am not in sunny Florida. I am actually in Washington, D.C., but I am enjoying a great group of people, so I'm happy to be here. I am Renata Spinks. I am the um, Assistant Director of C4. That's Command, Control, Computers, and uh, Communication. And uh, basically what the Director and I there do is we work on all of the tactical networks within the Marine Corps no matter where you are located. Um, my focus right now is creating that war fighting space for the technology we're accessing in a degraded, um, um, intermittent or limited environment. Um, and for the things that we have going on today, also, you know, how can we execute command and control in a deployed um, situation? Um, I hail as a army veteran and I am happy to be here. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And folks, we have a great panel today. Um, lots of wonderful questions lined up to um, collect their perspectives on um, diversity in the workforce, specifically cybersecurity, um, and why closing that gender gap is so critical to advancing the field of cyber. So let's go ahead and stick with you, Ms. Spinks, if you don't mind, um, with just that question specifically. Why is closing the gender gap so critical to advancing the field of cybersecurity? 
So, I mean, that's an awesome question. Um, I, I'll, I'll take two parts of it. Closing the gender gap is for, from my perspective and the Marine Corps perspective based on two things. One of them are the tenets of how we manage our talent and then the ethos that we live by. There, there are a few things that we, you know, continuously live by uh, within the Marine Corps. And that's based on the way we approach command and control and war fighting. And there's a gap of cyber talent, first of all, right? Everyone is struggling in that area. And we've, dis we've discovered that over the past, you know, 10 to 15 years of how do we develop talent in this space? And, and, and in the meantime, how do we not only keep up with a near peer competitor, um, those names start with C's and R's and I's, right? Um, how do how we make sure that we are focused in on those capabilities, but at the same time, the equality and diversity of thought that comes with the gender gap is one of the most critical pieces in the world. There are so much that can occur when you think differently, when your perspective is not the same. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that, this, that these um, statistics show that in such a male dominated field, there is a loss of diversity which means there's a loss of solutions that you may or may not have thought about, um, the paths of getting there. Um, so the importance of closing that gender gap is not just based on, we just want to flood this career space with, with females, right? That's not what it is about. It's about creating a space that um, takes advantage of all the value that, we're, we, that we have to offer. Um, it's not something that isn't valued. It's just not an area of focus for many different reasons, whether that's been um, the, the talent gap, whether that's been choices that have been made based on culture or based on historical information, um, the trends and times. I, I know Dr. Um, Hereford is going to talk a little bit about statistics, et cetera. So I think it's important to note that it's really not just about closing the gap, but it's also sustaining you know, making sure when that talent enters, you have to also be able to sustain that talent. So closing the gender gap, for me, the criticality is you got to manage your talent. And right now, we're not doing a great job of that when we have a one-way ticket into a one-thought process. So that diversity of thought is so critical to move us forward. Yeah, certainly. I'm sure some of you others on the panel have some thoughts on that question as well. It's interesting to hear your points about, um, you know, diversifying the, the uh, workforce in cybersecurity is, is not just about uh, different colors, different genders, different walks of life, socioeconomic backgrounds and things like that. But um, the, the thought that that brings to the to the workforce and to the teams is so important and critical to um, creating our defenses and, and operating um, in a way that really places kind of the, the core of security at a forefront. So yeah, Marcella, did you have something to share? Yeah, I was actually I was actually gonna add, um, Renata, that it's it's very interesting because you know you're working at C4. And I have to say the one place where I saw the most diversity in cybersecurity was actually in the military. Um, because they have specific allocations for gender types as well. Um, you know, based on whether you're going to be on a ship or you're going to be forward deployed. Um, that's actually where I worked with the most women in cybersecurity was actually while I was in the military. And uh, because that's where I got my start in cybersecurity, it was quite a shock to me getting, coming out of that space and seeing how few females there, there were integrated into the commercial workforce in cybersecurity. And then just the biases that came with that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important piece. Um, you know, it's it's I don't want to make this about the military, but but it, when you think about, you know, the military, when you're in the military, we're not looking across saying, you know, I'm getting shot at and I don't want you to help me because you're a guy. It doesn't happen. We, you know, we don't say um, well, I don't want you to help defend against an adversary because you're a girl. And that dynamic is very different, um, even from basic training or the basic school within the Marine Corps. 
that dynamic and that training is very different and that, that culture is very different. But the Marine Corps isn't perfect. And there are still areas where we can improve um, when it comes to keeping that talent and in, inserting that talent and how how we venture into the space in the commercial space after that military service. Um, I, I do think there are some areas we can definitely improve because um, we haven't really, we really haven't figured out what happens when we do exit the military as females who have all that great experience. And then that, that gender gap starts to, to seek because we went a different direction. Um, mm -hmm. Some feedback I've gotten is, is, you know, priorities change, you know, within the military is very structured, it's very different. It's very um, disciplined and it's very um, mandate based or based on orders. And then you get out of the military, you got a little bit of a choice, right? And so um, the, 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 the dynamics change and the paradigms change. Um, and I think Miss Olivia, Dr. Um, Hereford has had some input. Yeah, I, you know, being only my experience, only being in the public and private sector, I see the military as an example. There's leadership and accountability for the goals that you, you want to set. And that makes a significant difference significant because until you have that accountability and you exhibit and 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 model it then you're 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 not influencing the people who have to make the decisions about going into this field about going into this role and you know being in, in right now in public education the equivalent of that are our teachers and our administrators and from my own experience in working in tech it was from my leaders, from my CEOs and CIOs that, you know, we're making a big difference and, you know, both positive and negative. So I, you know, I applaud <laughs> what's happening in the military because I think that we can, we can learn. We can really learn yeah. a lot. Wonderful. So we've heard accountability, leadership, of course, both absolutely critical um, in terms of closing that gender gap. And, and when we do work towards closing the gender gap, the diversity of thought that comes along with that. Um, so let's transition a little bit. Um, and I want to kick off this next question with Miss Sandy Silk. Um, Sandy, what are some of the things that got you interested in technology? And were there any resources that helped you as a woman pursue the career path? Sure. And can you hear me now? We can. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. It is. Um, I, I can't say I was ever drawn to technology. I wanted no career in technology. <laughs> um, my, my degrees are in Germanic languages and literatures, and I was going to be a professor. Um, I happened to take a summer job as a, an executive assistant to a CIO of one of the business lines at Fidelity Investments in Boston who, so I'd finished my master's, so this is before PhD, uh, and she just saw great analytic skills, communication skills, um, able to read social cues and such, and thought, you know what, we need to stand up a disaster recovery plan. We need to be addressing Graham Leach Bliley Act and you know, all of these mm -hmm. dealing with people and looking at technology uh, not to say I wasn't strong in STEM because I was very strong in math and science, but I just had not thought to go in that direction. But I had fantastic managers who just saw potential and encouraged me to go get my CISSP so that when I was then doing on-site vendor evaluations for products we were going to integrate. So this is before SaaS, um, before you know people had... Uh, cloud-based data centers, but have their own, you know, going to see what are your security controls, what's your data center physical and other controls. Um, and I was, of course, the only woman. Um, so I had, you know, encouraged me to get my CISSP so I would be accepted to, they passed the mic to me frequently. All these, my male teammates were great. I would be the only woman in this conference room and I had blonde hair at the time. Uh, you know, oh, is she going to take notes and be like, here, you lead the meeting. You tell them what the security deficiencies are and what they need to do to uh, improve. You know, and the guys were just sitting there like, yep, this is what, you know, this is what you need to do. And the woman's telling you it. So it was really good to help me build my confidence because I've almost always been the only woman in the room still today when I lead the workshops frequently. I'm the only woman there. So, uh, you know, I, I really value that they 
gave me the training, saw the potential in a non-traditional candidate, uh, and encouraged me even with the confidence to be that different one in the room who could take the mic and command the room. Yeah, I think that's a really good perspective. You know, when we think about the degree programs that do exist and sort of their the maturity of those programs and, and how old the field is, a lot of folks don't have a background in cybersecurity and have somehow found themselves in the cybersecurity space. Um, and simultaneously, it highlights the fact that um, cybersecurity is such a cross-disciplinary field um, when we're talking about policy, as you suggested, when we're talking about some of the more technical aspects. Uh, maybe we're looking at risk and compliance. Um, so I'd be interested to hear if anyone else has comments. What are some of the things that got you all interested in the field? And um, would you put your finger on maybe a specific resource that um, kind of helped you along and or sh shown some light on, on the career? Well, you know, I think it starts early, particularly for, for women. Um, I, I have seen a lot of girls and, and young women in, in college are attracted to not only cybersecurity, but tech in general, because they want to make a difference, because they want to have some type of uh, a social or, or, or larger, a larger impact. You know, I know that was my reason way back in the day. I mean, I was, a, I was crazy, crazy, crazy about science fiction and robots and things like that. So um, you know, I was very interested in, in, in technical things, but I had nothing around me other than just this personal curiosity. And fortunately, um, uh, while I was going to college, I, uh, I worked at IBM as, as an intern. And so that's what got me started. But I, I, had, no, I had nothing other than that. And I, I see a lot of that in, in, in young women today is that they just, they, they're not exposed to it, but they're coming at it with some kind of a passion or kind of a personal um, interest until, you know, they're discouraged. <laughs> and uh, we can talk about that later, but it does, it, I mean, it really, it really does start from a personal desire to, to make a difference, I think. Yeah, I think you've uh, provided us the perfect transition, uh, unless Ms. Spinks, did you have something to share? Um, yeah, I know she said we talk about it later, but, but I'll tell you, <laughs> why I became interested was because I got tired of people telling me it's too hard you'll never be successful you should just do this or do that so it was even though I had the intellectual curiosity from from a little girl my mom was taking correspondence courses um I wasn't exposed as as much as I wish I would have been I did take a few coding courses in eighth or ninth grade um but yeah, it was what kept, what keeps me here. You know, what has, what has caused me to continue to pursue. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's really, it's really just been about the challenge when I've been told by people who don't go to the same place of the bathroom, unless it's a multi-gender uh, location, that you'll never be successful in this field. It's too hard. Um, you should just go do it, you know, X, Y, Z. And, and I'm pretty sure some of our viewers Viewers have and the panelists have experienced that. For sure. Yeah, no doubt. And kind of kept us on the same track where I was headed. So I appreciate that. Um, and I might jump back to Dr. Hereford for kicking off this next question. I'm sure lots of you have some thoughts here. But um, in terms of some of those barriers to entry and, and some of the reasons why more young ladies and women aren't showing an interest in tech and cybersecurity. What are some of those reasons? I know we've shared a little bit about exposure and, and some other things, but um, what are some of those reasons and, and what can schools or, you know, coaches or parents or counselors or role models for these um, young women do to start to kind of shift the needle a little bit? Well, yeah, again, I, it, I think it goes into two buckets. It is, first of all, as you mentioned, a lack of awareness and exposure. Um, but I think that the second part is a, a, a lot of girls and, and young women uh, start to develop this perception that they don't fit, that they don't belong. And, um, you know, that's what Renata was talking about. You get, the, you know, you, you get so many, oh, you can't do this. And the people teasing you, you know, you know, I grew up being a nerd and I was just bullied all the time because of it. Right. So you, you, you so you try to, you, you, you think there's a fit for you. So I, again, I go back to 
the leadership and the equivalent of leadership in, the, in, in education are our faculty and our teachers. I did some research when I moved into this working in the sector of career education about what, what were the barriers. And as we know, we've been talking about, they were so systemic, Brad, that it was depressing. And so I flipped it and I said, well, what's working? Why do some girls persist? Why do some students of color prevail? And it's usually a teacher. Mm. It's usually someone who um, encourages them, makes them feel welcome, makes them feel that they can belong and do this work. And I think on the exposure side of things, I think we can do more as young as we can. You know, so for example, there's lots of wonderful cyber camps, uh, capture the flag type competitions that we can do all the way down in middle school. But I don't see the girls there either. And I think it's because they're not getting that exposure. They don't think it's for them. It's improving. It's improving because we're pushing real hard from the community college to, uh, to that, you know, trying to pull up those students into our programs. Because the community college programs, by the way, uh, have long had um, cybersecurity uh, education from the SOC, the, the, the Security Operations Center. The, 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 all of that training has been going on for over a decade in mm -hmm. community colleges because, you know, those, those are the folks that come out and run, you know, operations and network centers, et cetera. They may not have the bachelor's degrees, maybe they'll get there, but they're the ones doing the work. And so one of the things we have to do is, is pull those young women into those programs so they can really see that this is something they can do. It's really not that hard. It's fun. It's exciting. You know, I mean, I've participated in a couple of the camps that are just so cool. So I think when you can get, you know, get, get, get them past that feeling of, of, of not fitting in, and that takes someone that's going to reach in and reach out and see what, see, another thing too is to see, see, see where their passion is. If you can find something they get excited about, it may not even be about cybersecurity, but a good teacher can recognize that mm -hmm. and begin to feed it and feed it, show them more, and they keep going. <laughs> yeah, Marcella? Um, yes, I'd like to just kind of play off of what Dr. Hereford said about you know the middle schools. Um, so. I actually have two daughters um, and uh, both myself and their father works in cybersecurity. So they're, have, they have always had the exposure to STEM related fields. But I think we do girls a major disservice at a very young age because we do not expose them to problem solving and STEM related toys right off the bat. Okay. So, and, and, People will tell me, well, Marcella, there are Legos for girls and girls play with, you know, these kinds of toys nowadays. That is not necessarily the case. I can tell you my daughter, who is only 12, when she was just a few years younger, went to play with the Legos with the boys at school and was told that those were boy toys by the boys. So we typically expose our daughters to more nurturing domestic types of play and we don't give them those, uh, the, those toys that really help them you know, develop their engineering skills and their problem solving skills at a young age. So by the time they do have the opportunity to get exposed to it, whether that be in you know, high school or college, it's already very daunting to them because they don't, they don't have you know, the, the base level of the play with it to really enjoy it and understand it. And so they go into it already with a daunting mindset. I can tell you when I went to high school, um, we had a Cisco lab at my high school. It was in the basement and no girl would ever go anywhere near it. It was an all boys club. And as a matter of fact, if you walked by as a girl and you're like, oh, what's going on in there? They'd be like, oh, you don't want to go in there. You know, that's that's the boys club area. That's where the boys go. So we need to do a better job of exposing young ladies at a young age to these types of play and toys that help them to be more critical thinkers and problem solvers, um, and not just focus so much on the domestic and nurturing toys. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to tag into as well there of finding their passion, right? 
I think that we have this concept that every cybersecurity job is technical, is extremely technical. And that is not the case. Um, and I, I struggled with this significantly in the beginning of my career because um, I did not take a computer course until I joined the military. And I was very much, much pushed into cyber. It wasn't a personal choice. It was the job that they gave me. And I, I took it and ran with it. Um, and I struggled with it significantly. And I heard all the time from my male counterparts, you're not technical enough. You're not technical enough. And it really forced me to go out there and feel like I needed to constantly become more technical until I realized that there were other jobs out there. There's cyber sales. And you still have to understand cybersecurity. You have to understand the problems and the challenges. Um, and But it doesn't uh, remove you from the field. It just puts you in a different type of role that may be better suited for you. And so while I've run and built cybersecurity operations centers for the, the first 15 years of my career, I've now realized that where I, I really thrive is in being able to basically express and communicate the business challenges and the business needs of cybersecurity to those who aren't as technical. So we need to, to show girls that it's not just a, a one size fits all. You don't have to be a hacker. You don't have to just be embedded in code all the time. There are other opportunities there. That's an excellent point. I really appreciate that. Sandy, did you want to chime in? I, I, I did want to chime in and I know, um, you know, so I, I have my master's from, from Harvard and they have a very strong women in um, computer science group there as well. But, but there is this bias about you need to have a COSI degree to be working in cybersecurity. And they would be lamenting that, well, we get the women in as first year students, but by that, you know, sophomore or junior year, now maybe it's just a minor as opposed to, you know, their major and, and they're majoring in like anthropology or sociology or psychology or business. And I'm thinking, what a phenomenal combination of things. This right. is great. You know, they're going to be able to tie things together. And why is that a loss for computer science? Because someone decided to marry, you know, communications or psychology with it. Um, you know, and we, we do know with COSI, you're not going to have many women or people of color coming out of the education system with that degree. So when we say you have to have that degree, you've already limited the pool of people who can apply, you know, and I, I've had people on the team I was on before not knowing my background, you know, disparage somebody else, you know, like a contractor temp who didn't seem to be getting it. Well, you know, I think he's an English major or something. It'd be like, you do know I'm a German major, right? So let's just put that to the side at this point yeah. and, and focus on, you know, did you explain what you wanted? Maybe it's a communication breakdown. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we tend to think it's a one size fits all and it, it does not fit more than one out there generally right now. Yeah. Well, wonderful. I think, um, you know, we've heard a little bit about the exposure side of things, um, you know, kind of broadening that lens, um, ensuring that um, young women and girls have access to learning opportunities and um, toys and other engagements um, from middle school or younger um, that can kind of shine some light on what careers in cyber look like and also underline the fact that not every career in cyber is super technical. And, and as you've all pointed out very nicely is, you know, there's certainly the law component to it. There's the policy component to it. There's the awareness component to it. There's the sales and marketing and the being able to communicate um, risks and needs from, you know, the more technical side of the house to the C-suite. So um, all of that is, is certainly educational on my part, so I appreciate it. But I want to kind of look at the flip side of it a little bit, and maybe I'll start with Ms. Spinks here. Um, how about the recruitment and talent management practices? I know um, we've heard from, from some of you about you know, maybe the military is, is one of the better examples of diversification in the cyber workforce, but how do recruitment and talent management practices need to be improved in order to support an increase of women in the cyber workforce? You know, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm listening to the conversation now and 
I think we've identified the leadership piece. We've identified the diversity of thought and diversity of skills that are embedded in every career path that you can think of because cybersecurity is you and I. It's it's no matter who you are. If you're a doctor, if you're a teacher, if you're um, a communicator, cyber the world is so digitized right now um, and it's not getting any less digital. So, so understanding that space is, is so critical. Um, I, I'd be a little disruptive and I wouldn't be myself if I'm not. Um, I would say that cybersecurity is very technical. And so what if it is? I don't know any woman who isn't very technical from how we explain ourselves to the nurturing piece that was talked about earlier, you know, raising children is very technical. Okay. Let's, let's just, you know, so there are there, the way our brains work, it's able to process the technical limitations that we, that, that, that I hear a lot. Oh, well, well, we'll just let them do budget because it's really not cyber. That burns my biscuit. I'm going to tell you, it just really does. Um, so to answer your question, I think we have to shift the way we think. Okay, we have to not limit the expertise that can be acquired, built, learned, no matter if it's later in life or early in life. We have to change the way we think so that we can be more inclusive um, and not try to steer away because that's a girl's thing or that's a boy's thing. So that, it, that's all about culture. It, it really is. Um, and, and, and then make it very deliberate. Work with people who are experts in the field of personnel, communications, sociology. You wanna know why you need to have those kind of people on your team when it comes to recruitment? Because I don't understand every culture and I need people who can tell me what things mean. It's, it, cyber is not unique to things we do in the military, such as if you know you're going to engage with the Japanese, then you have cultural personnel with you who teach you certain things, right? You know, um, there's things about handshakes. Um, there's things about which hand to use. Um, there are so many things that are needed within the recruitment area that we limit ourselves um, when, we, when we still have a closed-minded way of thinking. So that is where the, the Marine Corps has really focused. I mean, we have a commandant that continues to talk about, you know what, you may have a programmer with tattoos. And the Marine Corps is very big on tattoos. That is a big deal. It is, you having tattoos is almost like you cannot have your high and tight and, and stand straight up like, like a Marine if you have tattoos. Well, there's a tattoo policy that was changed now. Um, so it's really shifting the way you think and seeing the skill and the opportunity versus some label that society has put on um, this, this person of color or this person who is Latina or this, you know, it's, we just have to make our mind up that we are going to shift the way we think and recognize we may need some help in that area. Nobody's perfect. And then we reach out to those people who are part of those cultures who can help us communicate, relate, um, and, and bring in those excluded um, either genres of personnel or those, those people who don't feel included, whether it's because they're young, whether they're, it's because they're older. I mean, I've, I've had women con converse with me and they'll say, well, I'm too old. I've done this for 30 years and, and I don't think I can do cyber. And, and I focus in and say, what do you mean you can't do cyber? You're, you know, you're the same, you're the same, and sometimes they're the same age as my mother. My mother is 70 years old. My mother has said to me, I don't want an iPhone because I don't want to learn how to use another phone. But then she starts seeing her grandkids FaceTiming, and then it's like, oh, no, I want to learn how to use this phone. And now she's like, oh, I want a MacBook. Now, that's my pocketbook. I'm just saying, but the fact that she wants a MacBook and she wants to use it so she can FaceTime me, uh, it's awesome. And so I think we just got to change the way we think. And if we do that as the foundation, I think everything else will fall in place because when we change the way we think, we'll start to seek out the resources that are needed to help us get it up, get over the hump and start to be more inclusive versus excluding. Yeah. I like that. I think, um, you know, changing the way you think is certainly an important aspect of it. Dr. Hereford, I'd be interested from your perspective. I know you work with quite a few students and um, maybe hear some feedback directly from 
those looking to get that first step in the field. Maybe some thoughts from you. Well, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's an equal shift needed on the job seeker side, too. Uh, and that is that um, they are our, our, our students finishing their AS degrees and their industry certifications. They all think that they're now ready to go out and get a job and somebody's going to hire them right away. And the first thing they say, well, you don't have any experience. So it gets very discouraging. And so even while there are programs about internships and apprenticeships, those are also very, they've been very, uh, I mean, employers are still having difficulty implementing that as a way of gaining experience. So where we're finding success is, again, coming back to uh, the point that Marcella made, is there are so many different ways to break into cybersecurity. And if you have a passion around, let's say you are a communicator, of some type. One of the things that I'm finding, I'm seeing students that get the experience that show and demonstrate they are a communicator. So maybe they're doing a volunteer work uh, for a nonprofit. Maybe they're, they're setting up their IT environment at the same time being of service and getting involved. Or, you know, maybe they're doing something at the school. They're helping with the cyber camps, being a near peer mentor, learning how to set up the environments for the camps. There are ways to show experience in your work that you've done, as well as how do you how you come across. And I'm finding that I'm seeing that work. And I think one of the I think it's again it's a shift. We have to we have to get them to understand that you know you can get that you know that CISSP associate, but you still need five years before you're a CISSP. And that's hard to get those. And you so you've got to get out there, get in, and. I, I'm seeing that work. It's been long. It's a long haul. <laughs> I've been watching it now for about five or six years, but it's changing. It's changing. Yeah, Marcella, so you might want to chime in. Yes. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I think I, I do a lot of coaching for and mentoring for, for women in the, exactly that same position that you mentioned, Dr. Hereford, where they're you know, they got their, their, their associates or their bachelors, or they've gotten a certification and they think they're ready for the workforce and then they can't land the job. Um, and there's a few things that I've unfortunately had to do. One of them is coaching them on how to interview because you have to interview making the assumption that you're going to, to land on a bias by someone. And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, you come into an interview and you want to talk about yourself and you, your personal life and your characteristics. And the moment you drop that you're a mother or, you know, that you're married, as much as we think those things are still not considered biases, they are. And I can give you a, a story about this. When I was trying to hire a technical sales engineer for my team one year and the VP of engineering was with me in all of the calls. And we uh, interviewed this amazing woman and the job required 50% travel time. And of course, through the interview, one of the questions was, can you travel 50% of the time? And her response was, yes, I have a son, but my mother lives with me and she will help me. And so I can travel 50% of the time. My VP of engineering, who was a man, immediately after the call said he did not think she was going to be a good fit because he did not think she was going to actually be a comfortable leaving her son to travel that often or as often as we wanted. And so I had to say to him, if she was a man, would you be saying the same thing? No, right? Because you would have assumed that mom was home or that he was less, uh, you know, connected to the child or committed to being home with the child. And so unfortunately, we have to coach women to say things, to not say things, actually, that may, you know, implicate that they're not as committed to their role as a male counterpart, and to be more overly confident than they typically would, um, and not be afraid to say, you know, yes, I can do that. Even if you can only do it a little bit, you have to say, yes, I can do it and be confident about what you're saying. Because their male counterparts will apply for jobs that they're only 40% qualified for. And women will yeah. only apply for jobs that they're 80% qualified for. So there's a lot of that coaching that has to go on, unfortunately, today to, to kind of uh, gap that, that bias that's happening. Yeah. I think these are interesting points and certainly all kind of ha have a mirror to them in terms of 
the experiences that these women and young girls and college graduates are are facing when they're pursuing careers in the workforce and what that means in terms of recruitment and talent management practices and how they can change. And Sandy, you mentioned something, and, and actually Marcella and Dr. Hereford, you did too, um, around college degrees and number of years of experience and certifications. And Sandy, you shared you got your CISSP, so you didn't look like uh, or be, because your boss told you to, you know, in, in order to gain some legitimacy and, and earn earn your respect um, in that room, um, it was recommended you go this route. Maybe talk a little bit about, um, you know, on, on the recruitment and talent management side, how do those practices um, and even things like job descriptions, for example, uh, maybe impact sort of the, the number of women and, and female applicants into the field? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and I I led an effort uh, within. So when I was at Harvard University, not as a student, but later as a um, director of education and consulting within their information security, the main information security group, we overhauled all of the job descriptions that would be, you know, job postings um, to true up. Do you to try to convince Harvard University, which is a Harvard which is a degree granting institution, right? That's their business, that someone working there does not need to have a bachelor's degree and it certainly doesn't have to be in a certain area. Um, it, it was a bit of an uphill battle, but I think when you look across your existing personnel and you say, do we have anybody who doesn't have a degree? Yes, we have a few who are really good. Like then you're saying they're not qualified for the job they hold. If you're saying this is a requirement and this would be a legal, a legal mess to be in if we say it is and we have to enforce it. Um, mm -hmm. And as we looked through the, oh my gosh, 40 bullet points. I mean, how many are in most cybersecurity related job listings? You know, you want the unicorn. Yeah. <clears throat> say, all right, you got to be prepared to interview every candidate on every one of those bullet points on there and evaluate are they really at a competency level you need? <clears throat> because if you can't assess, why is it on there? You know, right. do I need to know a specific language or do I need to have a capability to learn languages as proved by some other language I learned? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we also looked for, can you work on a team? Can you solve problems with others? And part of the interview process would be to work through a problem with three or four people from the existing team. We don't care if you get the right answer. We just wanna see how, what is your problem solving method and are you asking for help for other, from other team members? And I think really stressing it's a team effort. You know, so hearing in, in the military, I think you have a natural team and you're expected to look to each other for support where when you enter the private sector now, there's this kind of hero factor, the firefighter, the person, the one who saves them all, um, where it can be perceived as a weakness to ask for help. So you're expected to know everything and not make a mistake. And I think also when you're the only and you make a mistake, you feel like I've just represented all womankind for making this mistake. <laughs> and my husband will say, how could you possibly feel that way? I'm like, put yourself in a room like that and make a mistake and see if you feel like everybody's looking at you and judging you because you're the different one. Yeah. You know, so, so I think you know, it, it's also we need to bring more diversity together too because you know, we, we can't have only women in cybersecurity. We need to have a melting pot of people or a mosaic. I've heard that's a better, you know, we're not all blurred together. We're our own separate making something bigger. Um, but yeah, the recruitment, the, the words we use are horrible too, you know, to be a ninja, a warrior, you know, these, these are not attracting, not only are they not attracting, they're repelling not only women, but other people who are like, I've been in that environment, don't want it again. Yeah. yeah. Ms. Sphinx, did you have something to share? Um, no, I think, I think Sandy hit it on all sevens, you know, from, okay. from the labels that, that we hear about. I'm a cyber diva. I'm, I'm a diva. I just want to, <laughs> I'm not a warrior. I don't, I don't do all that. Even though I was in the military, even when I was in the military, I was a diva. You will see my name is she, her, and empress. Okay. I'm not yeah. an empress. I am an empress and I have queens. 
Okay. So, so definitely I am all in on, on the labels that we, you know, it's all about being inclusive. Um, and it just goes back to, to the culture of adopting and that experience thing, Marine Corps is hiring. We have MOSs, you know, come on in. We're not looking for you to have all this experience. We will get you the experience that you need. And, you know, we're all about character. So we do discriminate. Okay. We discriminate on character. If you, you if you come in and you want to join the Marine Corps, come on. Because we don't, I mean, the, the paperwork you have to fill out, that's, that's the Department of Labor statistic required. We we don't we don't have any discriminatory factors when it comes to females and and male. We we want that diversity of thought. We want that expertise. We want that grit and resilience because it's in you. It's in each one of us. And 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 women are no different. Um, we just have to. We just got to get into a space where we are more deliberate, like what Sandy was saying. You know, the fact that some of those um, reactions are in place is the truth. And, you know, and, and those are those are the areas that are unfortunate. And and I myself am committed to to building bridges and, and breaking down those barriers and letting mm -hmm. letting women know, hey, we have a place here. Um, the Oscars showed that the other night with the um, one of the Latinas who got an award. I just loved her presence when she said, if anyone has ever told you you don't have a place, then, you know, I'm a, I'm a good example that we do have a place um, in media. Of course, that's what they were talking about. But just women in general, no, mat no matter where you are and what you're doing, today it's cyber. Tomorrow it'll be science. The next day it'll be mathematics. Um Depending on where you are, it'll be education as well. I mean, I've been to some places where I was literally looking for a female doctor, right? I'm starting to be exposed to them now. That's why I love, look, I was like, oh, we have a female doctor, Ms. Dr. Hoyer for which was great, um, who's focused on cyber. There, there are many, that's a gap, right? Um, so I'm, I'm loving this panel. And I, I think that um, we're all hitting on, on all sevens when we're, when we're talking about such a critical topic. Yeah. I was uh, getting ready to transition to another question off of our sheet here, but um, we've actually had one come in from the Q&A box. And it's a good reminder for those of you um, that are viewing this panel today, please feel free to drop questions um, in that Q&A box. But uh, this one from uh, one of our attendees was, I thought, quite interesting um, and certainly on point with the, the recent question on talent management and recruitment and such. Um, but we have an, an audience member asking, who should be leading the charge on promoting women in cyber? Is it the government's responsibility? Is it the tech vendor community? Is it the education sector? What are your thoughts on, on is there somebody specific or, or a sector specific that should really kind of um, kind of take that weight? Marcella, go ahead. It, it needs to be everybody. You cannot pigeonhole it into to one specific area. I mean, I think, you know, the government has attempted to do some of that with saying, for example, you know, you have to have women on boards. It has to be 50-50 now on boards of publicly traded companies. There's only so much that that you know the government can do. It really needs to be a concerted effort across the board because it is a journey, right? It's not just about getting the jobs, as we mentioned. It starts all the way at the younger childhood years and fostering and developing the skills that it's going to take in order for you to be able to get that job later in life. And so if you don't start it from, from a very early age and you don't pave the way from a very early age, you're never going to, it's not going to matter how many jobs they make open because you're not going to have women to fill those jobs in the future. So I always tell my daughter, right, my daughters, that what we need are more trailblazers. We need more people who are willing, more women who are willing to put themselves out there and literally clear the path for other women or girls who are coming behind them. And I tell my daughters this all the time. Mommy is here to be the trailblazer and open the door for the other women that are coming behind her. And it's, it's painful. It's not an easy job. You have to put up with a lot, but we have to be the ones that don't give up and, and continue to fight so that other women can be in these positions. I've literally had jobs where people will tell me, oh, we're really excited to hire you because you're a diversity hire. 
And I mean, right off the bat, I could be like, okay, well, I don't want a job just because I'm a, I'm a diversity hire. I want a job because I have the merit to be in that position. Right. But you know what? I will take that diversity hire job and I will hire five more women beneath me mm-hmm. of all ages and colors and, and different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And then they will hire women beneath them. And that is how you have to do it. You have to basically target it from the bottom up with the educators helping the young girls, bring them into those position and the women that are able to stay in their roles now, continuing to pave the path for the ones in the future. Yeah. In all areas, government, education, commercial, whatever it may be. Yeah. I think um, kind of to your point, we saw, I think it was just this week um, from CISA, uh, Miss Easterly made a comment about, you know, really putting her foot down and, and leading that charge and kind of taking that baton and um, sort of acting in a way that you've just shared is, is certainly important in bringing the workforce to 50% uh, female representation by 2030. So very cool. Dr. Hereford, did you have something to add here? Yeah, I think I just want to point out that the the question itself reveals where our opportunity and challenge Mm -hmm. is, because it's missing the broader business private sector. It's not just government that needs to solve this problem or the tech industry making the products like Fortsight or, you know, education. We're all working toward that. But it's it's when we have a data breach of a target or I mean. Nobody mentioned, you know, well, what's Target doing? What's Bank of America doing? What's the, what are they doing to hire more women in, in information security? So, and that goes back to that whole talent management HR challenge that we have. And that is that we have to start to change perceptions about where these jobs are and getting employers to realize that we have a very diverse workforce willing and ready to to get into these jobs but i and i and i tell you i i'm working on that because my role as employer engagement i'm knocking on these doors and saying <laughs> hey <laughs> anyway but we have to start yeah. focusing there too because i had a friend of mine say to me you know um in a data breach at a company again which I'm, i don't want to mean to pick on target but you know um it's the ceo's head that rolls and so all, all from, from large corporations all the way down to small, medium-sized businesses, especially those that want to do government contracting, <laughs> you need this talent. And uh, there's a diverse workforce out there waiting and wanting to get that experience in those jobs. Yeah. And Sandy, I want to collect your thoughts. I saw sort of a, a related question come in, and so maybe you can kind of... Um, tail your answer a little bit to include, um, you know, why do we still have the problem? I think we've discussed that a little bit. You know, there, there's certainly shifts from all angles that need to happen and responsibilities across the board from, you know, not just the commercial space or the government sector or whatever, um, but a, a, a 360 degree kind of solution here. Uh, but Dr. Hereford mentioned a little bit of a cultural shift. Um, and what that looks like. Um, you know, the role of the media and entertainment industry, of course, we've seen them pave the way in um, other fields um, and, you know, create um, uh, role models, if you will, even though they're on the big screen, um, but certainly doesn't hurt the situation. Just go ahead, Sandy, what, what, what did you have to say? So, you know, I have two ideas there. I wanted to, um, you know, first follow up on the, the diversity hire I've flipped that for, you know, for other women in tech that I've coached as well to say, you're a commodity, you know, you are in short supply. You know, I know anytime I apply for a job, I know I'm getting an interview because I'm a woman and I'm qualified for it. (laughs) Um, So I'm looking to see why would I want to work for you? Because I have a choice of a lot of places all looking for me. So it really is, don't look at it like, oh no, we need to find a woman. It's like, oh no, we got to find a way to attract that woman to come here who's a big leader in the space, who's going to attract more women, more women behind to make us better and make them feel like they've really had a coup when I've decided to join them. Not that like, oh, was I the diversity hire? You know, so I've told them, celebrate it. You're going to get lots of interviews, compare, tell, you know, and say, why, how would I feel welcome? 
But I, I think on that cultural shift as well, it's reimagining what it is to what they depict as somebody in cybersecurity, right? You know, we're not all yeah. in hoodies in our basements, never talking to anybody, um, typing like mad, you know, breaking code in, you know, seconds and like now I'm in. You know, it's problem solving that goes on with the team that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of people making mistakes and that's okay. Now we learned something. Now let's move forward from that and talking with business about, do you want to do this or not? Um, I'm advising, you know, I think it's a good risk or a bad risk, but it's on you if you want this to happen because you didn't, you know, you didn't hire enough of us for what you want to do. But, you know, really make it, it's not the hero. It's, you know, it's a team effort and we all support each other. And you have yeah. to, you have to trust everybody on that team to bring their best to the table and not yeah. be too shy to say something because they feel they'll be shot down. Because that's usually yeah. the one who knows it. <laughs> it's like, Wonderful. Why don't they get it? <laughs> um. Well, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I'm learning that with this last 57 minutes. We are down the uh, home stretch here, and I want to kind of go around Robin real quick with one last question. We didn't get to everything in a Rolodex, but um, I think it's important to leave this conversation with one piece of advice that you might have for a young female interested in pursuing cybersecurity. So maybe we will go in reverse order of our introductions, and we will start with Ms. Spinks. Um, One piece of advice for young females looking to get into the field? Uh, one piece of advice is seek out those mentors. Um, keep intellectual curiosity um, at the forefront. And the third piece mm -hmm. is you have to have the confidence of, of who you are to bring to the table. And so it is not a curse to be a woman, but it is yet a blessing. And that's biblical. I think we're only ones who can have kids. Thanks for having me. Love it. And Sandy, over to you. Yeah, I would advise, you know, it's absolutely worth it, but make sure you have your support group behind you and ready for, for when you're going to have those bad days where you feel like, you know, you just failed on behalf of all womanhood or, you know, whatever your group may be that, you know, can, can talk you back, you know, off the ledge that, you know, like you're, you're really overblowing this, you know, tomorrow's a new day, do it this way tomorrow. Wonderful. Marcella. I would say that the one piece of advice I would give um, is don't get discouraged. And remember that when someone is saying something negative to you, it's really just a reflection of themselves. It doesn't have anything to do with you. It is the fact that they are probably intimidated by you and deathly afraid of whatever it is that you're going to bring to the table. So do not get discouraged by what people say to you. And remember, what your purpose is in that, in, in your career, in your life, and what you're trying to achieve. Love that. And last but not least, Dr. Hereford. Well, I got to share a, a, a tidbit of advice that I got from a 26-year-old powerhouse of a cybersecurity engineer who I connected with right after she got out of college. I've been following her for about three years. And she says, never compare yourself to anybody but who you were yesterday. That's confidence. I love it. Well, what a way to drop the mic. Um, we are going to close out today's session um, before doing so. Of course, um, I can't wrap this up without thanking our wonderful panelists, uh, Dr. Hereford, Miss Sandy Silk, Marcella, and Miss Spinks. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for your perspective. Thank you so much for serving as a role model in the field for everybody, not just the young women and girls and, and really paving the way so we can make this change real. Um, and wrapping up, I would again like to thank the Association of U.S. Cyber Forces, the Guerrilla Corporation, and of course the Tortora Breda Institute for their support in making today's panel happen. If you are not currently a member of the Institute, we invite you to visit our website and learn a little bit more about how you can participate. And with that, we have our hour on the nose. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.